reading this morning is from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 17. Now, when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling, in all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel. Did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words, and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, um, we just come before you today, um, just humble by your sacrifice, amazed uh, that you love us so much that you sent your son uh, to be born. And Lord, let us never forget that this season, um, through all the celebrations and busyness that it would never depart from our minds. Just be at the forefront always of why we are celebrating and what we are celebrating. I just pray that you would be with Mark um, as he uh, expounds on your word, that we just um, are so grateful for the Bible um, and, and what it is. But you would be with Mark this message, in this message, that it would be your words through him and not his words, Lord. Give us open minds and humble hearts as we receive them, that we might grow closer to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning again. Have you ever had the greatest of intentions, only for it to backfire? Have you ever desired to do the right thing, but then in the end, it isn't quite what you expected. Um, so for instance, when I was about three years old, I decided to help my dad out with a project. Now my dad did not realize that I wanted to help him out. But something, something in the, in the driveway, I remember I'm three years old, so it's very fuzzy for me um, to remember all this, but Something need a fre needed a fresh coat of varnish. I think it was our trailer and had some wood on it, and so we, my dad needed to revarnish that. Um, and so he set everything up in the driveway, and he got to work, finished the project, and when he was done, he made the mistake of failing to immediately put everything away, including the brush, including the varnish, including the lid on the varnish, and I 
in all of my wisdom at three years old, saw an opportunity to help Dad out. Instead of wood, I noticed the door of the car parked on the driveway. And needless to say, Dad was not very happy with me. Although my mom was on my side saying, it's your fault, Greg, that you left everything out, which you would never have to hear about. But I'll be honest with you, at three years old, yeah, I was an eye kid, but I honestly had good intentions. I wanted to help out. I was curious, but I also had good intentions to help my dad out, but they were far from what my dad wanted. Now, David finds himself in a similar situation. His good intentions to build the Lord a house is far from what God actually desires. So here's David. He's living in a house of cedar. It's a beautiful home, a beautiful palace, while the Lord dwells in a tent. So one can understand David's concern. Imagine him going in to worship the Lord in this tent, looking around and seeing the God of the universe is dwelling in this place, and I have a beautiful palace that I live in. I'm the Lord's servant. I should not live in a better home than the Lord himself. David knows that he is on the throne because God willed and planned him to be the king of Israel. Everything David is, everything that David has, is because of the Lord. Why should David live in a nicer house than the Lord? Why should David live in a house of splendor when the Lord dwells in a house of cloth? Now, we could take this passage, in fact, as I read through commentaries, they focus a lot on the covenant that's found in, the, in these 17 verses. And that's there. It's there. It's very, very important. God's covenant with, with David. But what caught my eye is eight times in this passage, and if something's repeated, it's probably important. Eight times in this passage, the word house is found. So is the covenant there? Yes. Is it important? Absolutely. Are there other things that God promises that are there? Absolutely. But I want to focus on that word house. David tells his most trusted prophet, Nathan, his plans. He desires to build a house for the Lord and to raise the glory of God above his own glory. David's heart is in the right place. But as good as his intentions are, they actually aren't the Lord's <coughs> intentions. For it's actually the Lord who has and will graciously work to build a house for David. So, strangely enough, he, David wants to build a house for, for the Lord. The Lord says, no, I'm going to build your house. And in the end, spoiler alert, the house is the same. Okay, that's, that's kind of where we're going. Okay? With, this, with this, this passage. David, his house, is graciously going to be built by the Lord. He turned, God turns to David, turns to David. He speaks to David, through Nathan, and he says, No, I will build you a house. Throughout Israel's history, God never demanded that his people build him a permanent house. He was fine with a tent. If he wasn't, he would have said so, Right? He had the tabernacle. That was enough for him. David would not build the Lord's house. Instead, God would build David's house. Not a house made of brick or stone or wood, but a dynasty. This has been God's plan all along. From the moment that David was taken from the field to be anointed by Samuel, to the Lord's protection of David while he was fleeing from Saul, to the seven and a half years of civil war, the Lord has been working to build David's house. And when David lies down with his fathers in the grave, the Lord will raise up his offspring to rule over a kingdom, which God himself will establish. By God, God's good and gracious work, he will cause David's throne to last forever. Not by 
by any work of David, not by any work of his sons, but by the gracious hand of God to fulfill <coughs> his covenant promises. But what about where God says that David's son will build a house in the name of the Lord? In verse 13, your son, your offspring, literally seed is the word there. In the immediate context, this points to the temple that Dave, or Solomon is going to begin shortly after David's death. He's going to begin building. This, instead of a tent, now there's a permanent building. And that's important, but that's not the point. That's not the point of this passage because there's also a long-term focus here. A present but not yet type of need in these words. So that word offspring in verse 12, it is the same word that is given in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. After Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they rebel against God's commands. In the garden, the Lord speaks a curse upon them and upon Satan. And here's what he says to the serpent, to Satan. He says, I will put enmity or hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise is healed. This verse is the first passage of Scripture which points to the coming Savior, the Messiah, who would heal the separation that was created between God and man because of Adam and Eve's sin, because of the fall. And so, yes, Solomon will build a, a mighty temple. He'll build a, a beautiful building that everyone will stand in awe at. <laughs> A building in which the Lord will eventually dwell in, just as he did in the tent, in the tabernacle. But that building is not a house that will last forever. In fact, the beauty of that building was not about the building. The beauty of Solomon's temple for God was to point away from the building and to the beauty of God. And eventually to the beauty of the house that God is going to build. Solomon, as good of a king as he is, he will eventually die. And his son will die. And his son's son will die. And over time, the people of God will be exiled into Babylon. And the temple will be destroyed. This beautiful building will no longer exist. And the kingdom, and a kingdom like that which David ruled over is going to be the longing of every heart of every single Israelite. They're going to long for the glory days to be brought back. But David's seed, his offspring, this is what the Jews were holding on to. David's seed will one day arrive to make and rule over the house of the Lord. See, when these words are spoken to David, David's mindset, understandably, is on Solomon, his, his son, his son is going to build this beautiful building. And God's going, hey, there's a deep meaning here. There's something that's more, more that's happening. Your seed, your offspring will come to the throne and will rule over the house of the Lord. Not a house, though, made of wood or stone, but a people. See, 2,000 years ago, Gabriel, the angel, appeared before Mary, and he says these words in Luke chapter 1. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give him, listen to this, the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. The seed was finally arriving. Not in a house of beauty and wealth, but in a manger that was filled with animals. Jesus, Jesus is the long-awaited son of David, the seed who would build and establish the Lord's people, the house of Jacob, the seed who would heal the rift between God and his people, which was created by Adam and Eve's rebellion. Like David, Jesus would rule over God's people. 
But unlike David, his kingdom will never end. Death will not stay his rules. Enemies will not conquer his kingdom. He and his house will be established forever. Not a house built by David, not a house built by Solomon, not a house built by Elm Creek Community Church, not a house built by anybody, but the Lord. The Lord is going to do this. The Lord is making this house. And strangely enough, it's a house that is built by Christ, the Lord. Turn with me to John chapter 14. Grab your Bibles, grab your Bible apps. This is Christ's famous words to his, his uh, if it's again in church history, you've heard this before, I have no way to drink in my life. John chapter 14, and I want to read verses 2 through 6. Now listen carefully. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I want to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is teaching his disciples. He says, in my Father's house are many rooms. In his Father's house, in the place where God the Father dwells, there are many rooms. Rooms which are reserved for those who are members of his household. So now don't read into this like I did when I was a kid. I didn't imagine, okay, this might have been audio adrenaline's fault. Anybody <laughs> falling back on that one? Yeah, yeah, everybody's singing it, right? Yeah? I, if you don't know, sorry kids, look it up on YouTube with your parents' permission. Great group. Awesome. Anyway. <laughs> I won't go down that road. These rooms, <coughs> they're not literal rooms being constructed in heaven for God's people to live in forever, and Jesus is the room service that changes the sheets and cleans the bathrooms. Right? And we think, like, oh, he's going to, to make a big apartment building in heaven for us all. That is not what Jesus is saying here. He is teaching that the house of God, if you want to say heaven, the house of God, not just heaven, but the people, it's not a building. It's a people. He is preparing the people of God to take their place in his eternal kingdom. And those who belong to him know the way to this eternal kingdom because they know Christ. They are part of the household of God. Because he is the only way, and no one comes to the Father except through him, through faith in him. And so if you know Jesus, he says, you know the Father. If you know Jesus, you are part of the household of Jacob, the house of David, the house of the Lord. Jesus will never be removed from his throne, and his people will never be removed from his house. Because his house, his kingdom, his people are established <coughs> forever. He says this in verse six, 16 of, of 2 Samuel chapter 7. And your house, your <coughs> kingdom, shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Your seed, your offspring will come. He will take the throne and he will rule over the house of Jacob. Not a temple, not an apartment building, but a people. But a people. This is why I say the temple was not meant to point to the temple. Well, after 
after the temple is destroyed, and years later, they start to rebuild the temple again, and, and everyone, a lot of people are celebrating, but the older crowd who remembers the Solomon temple, they're in tears. Because they're like, look at that drab house. Compared to what it used to be, it used to be beautiful. Look at that thing. They were seeing the outside of the building and the beauty of the building and forgetting about the one who's supposed to dwell in the building. They were forgetting that the beauty of Solomon's temple was not to point to the brick and the mortar and the cedar. It was to point to the one who was glorious, the one who resides within the temple, the house who makes us his people, who makes his people established forever. If uh, you've spent time with me, and I mentioned this during the announcements too, like if you've spent any time with me, like Katie, she doesn't trust me the last couple of weeks because my brain just like doesn't work anymore all of a sudden. I don't know if it's too full. I don't know if I got hit too many times as a football and it's finally starting to catch up to me. I have no idea. But here's what I can say. And maybe you're in my place, so let me be a little bit transparent. Again, I'm walking away from my notes, so pray for me. But... But sometimes, I, we can put on this facade, especially at Christmas time. I love Christmas. I absolutely love it. I love the time I get to spend with my family. But I'll be honest with you, it's been really difficult to get into the Christmas spirit, whatever that is. It's been, it's just been too hard. And it's not like, oh, life is crazy. We've got 30 people coming for Christmas. No, I'm just being me. Like, my brain's not working, or I'm too focused on something else, or other things are coming into my life, distractions, irritations, busyness, making plans, thinking ahead. All of these things are overwhelming my brain. That's what I want. That's what I want. It's not only me. It's just everything else around me that's making me crazy, right? I, I, I want the Christmas spirit. And it's almost like I'm expecting this, like, yay, kind of feeling, right? Like when you were a little kid, you can't sleep the night before. And you know what I'm thinking now? Like, I just want to go to bed. I just want to go to bed. And those of you who have, who have talked to, and, and, and even this morning, Kim, Kim, that's just, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm here. I'm here to worship. I'm here to spend time with my church family, people that I love to worship him. And this week, this, this passage has been really weighing on me. Because it's almost like, it feels like at Christmas time, we have to build the house. We have to make sure it's really good and really nice. And, and all the memories are there. And thank goodness it snowed because I hate brown Christmas scenes. And like all these outside things. And forgetting that it's, it's not about the busyness. It's not about all the meetings and all of the family events and the things that are going to happen in January, February, and March. It's not, it's not even about, okay, so when are we going to open Christmas because, or our presents? Because let's be honest, the service on Sunday morning is really screwed up my schedule. That means I have to actually get out of my pajamas on Sunday morning. Okay, anybody else there? No? Really? I'm the only one. Thank you, Emily. Okay, you're all a bunch of liars. Because <laughs> the reality is, is that becomes important. Like, I can't wait to just stay in my pajamas all day. I hope a blizzard comes. Just put in a movie, watch It's a Wonderful Life, or Elf, or something else. Make sure kids do too. Ask your parents what movie you can watch. It's not a promotion of any spe specific movie, but you get the idea, okay? We get distracted. It's about the memories. It's about the feelings. It's about wanting to make it special for your kids, your grandkids. It's about spending time with family. And I'll be honest with you, I'm really struggling to even get excited to have my kids open the gifts that, that we got. Not because they're horrible gifts, but because my mind is not set on the right thing. I just talk to my wife and kids. I don't know how many times Katie and Sweet says, how are you doing? It's a loaded question. It's a loaded question. 
Because despite all of these things that are going on, despite all the plans and making sure, okay, well, what are we going to have for you when your family comes over? Or what are we going to do for Sunday morning? Or, you know, what's, what's going to happen after the service? And what's this? And what's that? And what's this? Despite all of that, this passage has reminded me that Jesus is on his eternal throne and we who know him are forever, forever his. Now when he came to earth, when he was born, he was already the king. And he willingly came. He humbled himself. It wasn't about plans. What's going to happen to celebrate Jesus' birth? It wasn't wasn't the gifts that was all there. It was just that they're not the point. They're not the point. Despite everything that's happening this Christmas season, <coughs> this passage has helped me, and I hope I hope it helps you to remember to remember this. <coughs> We should stand in amazement and glorify the Lord for his great and steadfast love for us. That he came, God himself came, to take the throne of David, to make the people his own, so that we might know the great and glorious love. So, maybe, maybe put it this way. Maybe we just need to let go of the Christmas spirit. Can I bah humbug that, that phrase? Can we all scrooge on that one? Christmas spirit. <laughs> because it's not about the Christmas spirit, guys. It's not. It's about Christ. Can we let go of the Christmas spirit? I'll tell you, your plans are going to get screwed up. Just want to let you know. It's going to happen. People are going to show up late. The food's not going to be exactly like you expect. Maybe you're not going to get the gift you really wanted. Okay? It's going to happen. And it'll still be wonderful. But that ain't what it's about. It's about Christ. It's grabbing hold of Him so that even if you don't have that Christmas spirit, even though you're you're like, ah, I want to stay in my pajamas. And you're saying that Sunday morning, next week, to go, but why do I come to worship with God's people? It's because I come to worship Christ. I want to grab a hold of Him. No matter what pair of socks or, or shirt or tie or whatever I get for Christmas, I will never, ever lose Christ if I belong to Him. If I'm part of His house, because He has made me Part of the household of God. And there's nothing that will remove me from that love. Nothing will remove me from this household. My life be taken from me. I lose all that I count dear here on this earth. It doesn't matter in the end. Because we have the one thing that's important, the one person who's important, and his name is Christ. He is our great and sovereign king. He is the one that the Lord has established on the throne of David over his people forever. And no amount of lack of Christmas spirit will change that. So hear these words in 2 Samuel. Hear these words of God's promise to send a Savior send an offspring of David to take the throne to make a people in his power for his people. So you got one week. I've got one week. I've got one week to be constantly reminding myself this is not about the Lord. This is about him. Where does my joy rest? Where is my joy? It is not in the holiday. It's not in the snow on the ground. 
It's not in the family that's going to come that we're going to see. It's in Christ. And he has made me part of his house. Just as he could. Father, I pray. Oh, Lord, I pray. God, I pray that we, as your people, would be reminded of this, of, of this truth this week, that you have made us a house, that you have placed your son on the throne, that, that you are preparing us. You are preparing not only a place in heaven, you're preparing us to be there with you. Not a, a building, Father, but to be your people, to worship you, to glorify you, to praise your name, to lift you up. And Father, this week, may, may we as your people have a little hint of that. Even it's just a shadow, God, of the, the glorious wonder that you are. May we stand in amazement of you. May we sing praises to your name. May we speak of the truth of your Son and the glorious gloriousness that you are, Father. And may you soften our hearts, even as your people, to let go of the things of this world to let go of the distractions, to let go of the things that will not go our way, and be reminded, Father, that above all else is you. You are our King. You are our Lord. You have made us your house. So may we look to you, praise you, and glorify you, and the words that we speak to the people around us, even in the, in the, in the stores and around the dinner table, we glorify to you and worship you in the Father. Yes, it's your precious name. Amen. Stand with us as we sing.